So our next order of business is to for me to introduce our speaker. I've known Gina Hampton now for probably 10 years. That's how long she's been in this church. And during that time, Gina has served Center of Enlightenment in many capacities. Um, she served on the board. She's helped the membership committee. She has done um, housekeeping here. And she's also a minister in training, very close to receiving her ordination. And so it's always good to see the blossoming of one of our students in training. And I know today she's going to share a very amazing lesson with you that's come out of our pastoral care class. And so um, I'd like you to welcome Gina Hampton to the podium. Thanks, everybody. Hi on Zoom. My pleasure to be here today. Um, so yes, this was one of my assignments and I was so very excited when I uh, had Spirit lead me to thinking outside the box. And um, as I was writing it, it was like, oh yeah, this is a sermon. Mm -hmm. So uh, the sermon I had actually planned went to the back burner and this one went forefront. <laughs> so um, it's always good to have one in the can, Gina. <laughs> always, always. <laughs> So we all know the saying, you're never too old to learn something new. This is true. As a student in the minister program here at COE, I'm rounding out my last few classes, and I'm learning so much about communication. One of my own fears is, what if I say the wrong thing? I don't want to offend anyone. For one of my class assignments, I let spirit guide me. And as I was surfing the net, I found a 12 page article on spiritual care of the non-religious. This article hit right with my goals for this basic pastoral class. Now you're probably thinking, I'm not interested in being a minister. So why should I care about what your article is about? Well, let me explain. Many of us have been in this situation, and if you haven't, one day you just might be. Have you ever visited a friend, a loved one, in the hospital, in a nursing home, in a rehab facility, or even their home after a sickness, an accident, or a death of a loved one? If not a visit, well, how about a phone call? Were you nervous, anxious? Did you think, I don't know what to say to, I, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm afraid. Maybe you even talked yourself out of even calling or going. I know I have. So as I share some of this article with you, please, Think of yourself, your family, and your friends. For example, every time I say chaplain, think of yourself. And every time I say people or patient, think of your loved ones. While reading the article, I was surprised. Their study states there is 22.8% of the general American population with no religious affiliation. Of that 22.8%, of them self-identify as atheist or as agnostic. The remaining 69% of them describe themselves as nothing in particular. The word religion is so charged that many people now define themselves by exclusion, as in no religious affiliation or spiritual, but not religious. Yet, what does it mean when so many from this group 
do believe in God, pray and consider religion important. I feel compassionate curiosity and humility can help us offer hospitality to those who have been hurt, rejected, or have chosen to leave their religions behind. Another surprise was learning that some non-religious people resent the idea that they might be considered spiritual. The allergy to religion sometimes spreads to rejection of spirit, spirit allergy too. Our training had led us to view every person as spiritual, yet it is our task as chaplains to engage the patient using the patient's language of meaning. Chaplains can indeed do their work efficiently without employing the language of religious or spirituality. Some of the things we can ask are, what is important in your life? Where are your significant relationships? What values are most important to you? What gives you strength in challenging times? What is disrupting access to these resources right now? A spiritual assessment tool considers seven themes, is designed to use language inclusive of both religious and secular worldviews. Each of these themes have their own continuum, and I have incorporated them with my sermon this morning. Everyone in the church is receiving a copy of those. Except me. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, just in case that you don't understand what I'm saying or um, I read it too fast. So number one is love and belonging. The need to love and be loved, to belong, to feel a connection with family, friends, community, people, and or God. This often presents itself as loneliness to our loved ones and families. The spiritual care focus from our point is offering relationship, appreciation, affection, facilitating connections to others, individuals and groups, nurturing a sense of relatedness, a feeling of being interwoven in the fabric of life and held by the ongoing kindness of people and or God. Number two, forgiveness and re reconciliation. The need to forgive and to be forgiven, to heal broken relationships with people, self, institutions, the world, and or God, and to address any unfinished business. This often presents itself as guilt. The spiritual care focus offering rituals of forgiveness and seeking closure and or reconciliation in relation to significant others, working to obtain wholeness through forgiveness. Number three, trust. The need to find trust or faith towards self, others, and or God. This often presents as fear. The spiritual care focus, reducing anxiety by being a non-anxious presence and by showing faithfulness in attendance and fidelity to promises, exhibiting full acceptance of others and commitment to their well-being, finding centeredness based in truth and faith that life is manageable or that comfort can be found in faith. Hope, the need to have hope in looking ahead. This often presents as despair. Spiritual care focus, helping a person grieve, hold old hopes and identifying with new hopes and offering consistent relationship. 
looking to the future with a sense that each day can hold promise and meaning. Number five, the need for one's life to matter and to regain dignity. For one's actions, past, present, and future to have import. This often presents as feelings of meaninglessness, the spiritual care focus, exploring the meaning of experiences, offering opportunities for meaningful participation in daily life, to do a life review, and possibly an ethical will, fostering a commitment that life itself is meaningful. Number six, gratitude. The deep desire to express thankfulness and appreciation of the blessings of life. The spiritual care focus, being fully present for a person as they verbalize, sing, write, pray, and smile, an expression of gratitude. Receiving gratitude, increasing awareness of deep-seated joy in life's blessings and offering thanks. And the last one, number seven, identity. The need to continue living true to one's unique identity and to not be confined or defined by one's illness or diminishments. Spiritual care focus, exploring resources for knowing earlier identity, building on it in conversation and ritual, building a unique relationship with a person and helping a person sustain their unique spirit in the world. As long as we are clear about our roles and goals as chaplains and understand the context in which we serve, we can confidently add many new tools to our toolboxes. We can wholeheartedly assist a patient in strengthening their relationship with God family, friends, colleagues, students, nature, online communities, the arts, values, and or other important things to them. Gives you a lot to think about. For example, we could bring an iPad or a cell phone and look up things that they are interested in, play a song that they like, find jokes, talk about family. You can imagine that list goes on and on. Find something that sparks an interest and brings up their vibrations. And you know, it might not have anything to do with a conversation at all. What words are being said? It could just be the fact that you're there just your presence, a long hug, or a hand to hold. At the end of your visit, you could ask them if they believe in God, would you like to pray? If they do not believe in God, you could end your visit with the open-eyed prayer. It is a simple yet powerful tool for use with non-religious. A chaplain can express a wish at the close of a visit that sums up the content and deep feeling of the encounter, as prayer would if prayer were part of the patient's language and spirituality. There's four here. The first one, I will be thinking of you tomorrow and hoping your surgery goes well. May you find clarity and peace as you consider your choices. I wonder what options might open that we haven't even thought of yet. And the last one, I will carry your joy with me today. Such simple phrases punctuating the end of a visit, said with care, let the patient know that they were heard, that they are not alone in their situation, there is possibility that things will not always feel as awful. At first I was overwhelmed 
Am I going to be walking on eggshells all the time? I don't want to offend anyone. And how am I gonna remember all of this? I'm afraid I'm gonna say the wrong thing. Fear. Yes, I had some fear. And then I remembered, if there's a will, there's a way. Take a deep breath, trust in God and trust spirit. After reading all of this, of what I, most of it I've copied and pasted, I can vision myself going to visit one, someone now and starting the conversation with the love felt, hi, just get it started. Don't be afraid. Remember to be in the moment and to really listen to what they are saying. I look forward to kicking my fears to the curb and my courage to be front and center. And the next time I'm gonna make that phone call or I'm gonna go make that visit. I'm not gonna be afraid. I'm gonna just let it be. Just do it. Thank you for letting me share.